Hello, and welcome back to the Sinobabble podcast. In this episode, we're going to be continuing on the theme of literature, moving on to talk about some of the early campaigns that were carried out against intellectuals, and more specifically writers, in the first few years of the PRC up until 1957. These campaigns form the backdrop to what would be the most dramatic and conclusive movement to silence independent thought in Chinese literature until the post-Mao era, namely the anti-writers campaign. Understanding these campaigns, the Hundred Flowers movement of 1956, and the aftermath of the Hundred Flowers, will also help explain why resistance to Mao's more extreme socialist plans was so limited, and how the Great Leap Forward disaster was allowed to take place. As always, just a couple of quick announcements before we get into the episode. You can sign up for the Sinobabble newsletter by going to the Sinobabble website, or you can now head over to the Substack and subscribe directly over there. As well as doing the regular newsletter, I've started a fortnightly series where I analyse a piece of current affairs news in China from a historical perspective. This week's newsletter explains China-US relations from a historical perspective, laying out why exactly a switch from Trump to Biden is not a cure-all for the fundamental conflicts that exist between the two countries. Also, you can now donate to the podcast by going to sinobabble.com, clicking the donate button, and giving either a one-off or monthly contribution. Any amount is greatly appreciated, and thank you so much to those who have donated so far. Okay, back to the episode. In the last episode, we went over the types of literature being published in the early PRC, policies surrounding literature, and the party's ambivalent attitude towards writers. The ever-changing attitude of the CCP towards intellectuals was reflected in a number of campaigns carried out against individuals, groups, and the literary community in general from 1949 to 1957. The scope and reasons for these campaigns varied widely, and we're going to run through all the big important ones today, as well as the brief period where the party actually pulled back from punishing intellectuals for being witty and allowed them to express their opinions for about three months before regretting their decision entirely. There are a couple of names that will be recurring throughout the episode that you should probably be aware of. They're basically high-level officials who are in the cultural and propaganda departments, So the ones that you should bear in mind are Zhou Yang and Hu Qiaomu. You'll also be hearing the names of writers from the last episode, so hopefully you remember them, but don't worry, the details of who they are and what they wrote aren't too important today. So we're going to start with a campaign called the Wu Xun campaign. This campaign began when a movie was released in December 1950, recounting the story of a 19th century educator named Wu Xun. He was a beggar who wanted to attend a school, but he was turned down by all the school teachers. He realised that it would be hard for poor people to improve themselves, and so he set about earning enough money to set up schools for the poor. He saved enough money to become a moneylender, then a landlord, and after 30 years he was able to open up his own school, eventually opening up many more franchises with the help of local officials. A flurry of articles were written in newspapers and journals praising the film, and in general the film was a big hit. But the party's attitude towards the film became negative, as the film contained a huge flaw. Wu Shun had tried to bring about change through education and reform, as opposed to revolution, and this act was seen as a reflection of the thinking of the majority of intellectuals, a way of thinking that would have to be forcibly changed. The rectification policies that came after this movie and the criticism towards it were released were mainly led by Zhou Yang, who, as I said, was a high-ranking official in many cultural and literary bodies. Zhou stated that, although we should emphasise education, we should not consider it above class and politics. He also added that there was no such thing as politically neutral. You are either progressive or reactionary. Throughout the summer of 1951, articles were released regularly tearing apart the film and its protagonist. The film was taken out of circulation, and the director, Sun Yu, was forced to issue a public apology. All those who had written in praise of the film now had to issue self-criticisms. Guo Mo Ro, who had originally praised Wu's acts as a miracle, which would never be replicated in today's society, published his self-criticism in The People's Daily. He also later co-wrote an article which offered historical evidence for the party's interpretation that Wu Xun was nothing but a wealthy landlord and a local thug. One of the co-authors of this article was Jiang Qing, Mao's wife. While taking the opportunity to have another self-criticism of his own mistakes, Guo applauded the author's efforts to employ the scientific historical ideas of studying and interpreting history, 
and announced that it indeed proved a true record of seeking truth from facts. While this campaign was levelled at mainly non-communist writers, another campaign launched in 1951 by prominent writer Ding Ling was aimed mainly at the League of Left-Wing Writers, the majority of whom were communist. It began with a criticism of the novel Between the Two of Us by Xiao Ye Mu, which we discussed briefly in the last episode. This story became one of the central topics discussed during this rectification campaign, along with discussions of Mao's talks at the Yan'an Forum and Stalin's writings on literature. Several writers were investigated and forced to publish criticism and self-criticisms, as well as being sent down to factories or down to the countryside to perform labour. Editors of the party's cultural and ideological journals were accused of lacking a clear political and ideological direction, especially the editors of People's Literature, Mao Dun and Ai Ching, two poets that we discussed in the previous episode. Though these campaigns were the largest and most comprehensive since the Yan'an rectification movement, they were both still relatively mild in terms of punishment, and things died down pretty quickly once people had finished publicly apologising by mid-1952. However, these campaigns had effectively silenced a large portion of the intellectual community, and so the party decided to loosen their control over intellectuals in 1953 in the hopes that their productivity would increase in time for the five-year plan. Articles were published in the People's Daily, extolling the necessity of intellectuals as teachers and researchers who were capable of imparting profound knowledge within society. There were calls by leading figures in the literary world to include a greater range of themes and styles in literature, as well as encouraging the professionalisation of writing over the politicisation of writers. The party also promoted the raising of artistic standards, but still emphasised the primacy of socialist realism, confusing writers even further and stifling the production of new works. Writers were still hesitant, and by 1954, the party was determined to bring the productivity of intellectuals back up again in order to align with its five-year plan goals. However, when they realised that their relaxed attitude was proving counterproductive, they quickly changed tack, opting instead to try ideological thought reform in order to increase productivity. The party set about launching a set of new campaigns aimed at undoing the relaxed atmosphere that they had created over the past one and a half years. What happened next was essentially a run of three back-to-back campaigns aimed primarily at three different men, Yu Pingbo, Feng Shuifeng and Hu Feng. Yu Pingbo was a professor at Beijing University and had been an active literary critic since the 1920s. Though he was mainly apolitical, like the majority of intellectuals, he did have one major fault, which was being the devoted student of Hu Shi. If that name rings a bell, it's because we spoke about Hu Shi in the episode on the May the 4th movement, as he was the guy who came up with the eight new rules for Chinese literature and was a staunch advocate for the simplification and modernization of the Chinese language as it appeared in literature, arguing that it should better reflect vernacular language. Hu Shi was very much not a supporter of the communists, and he actually left mainland China first for the states and then for Taiwan, where he continued to write naughty anti-CCP pieces. He was basically an enemy of the party until about 1986, when his image was somewhat redeemed, And so being a supporter of his in the 1950s meant that you were obviously looked upon with suspicion. So back to Yu Pingbo. Yu's first work had been a literary criticism of the famous 18th century novel Hong Lo Meng, or Dream of the Red Chamber, probably the most famous work of literature in China and certainly the most widely circulated. If you don't know the story, it essentially follows the decline of the prominent and wealthy Jia clan, and was famous for its huge cast of characters, with over 400 named characters and 40 people considered to be the main characters. So I don't want to hear anything about this podcast having too many names to remember, okay? This is the least of your problems. The story mainly centres on the relationship between Jia Baoyu and his two female cousins, Lin Daiyu, whom he loves, and Shui Baoqi, who he ends up marrying. Yu Pingbo's original interpretation of the book was that it was essentially an autobiography of the author, Cao Xueqin, an interpretation he had written in the 1920s under the guidance of his mentor Hu Shi. So we fast forward to 1953, and the CCP has ordered literary critics to reinterpret all the Chinese classics using a Marxist lens. So historical materialism, class struggle, the five stages of history, etc. The correct interpretation of Dream of the Red Chamber, 
would have been that it was a social commentary that reflected the decay of feudal society and shed light on the corruption and decadence of the wealthy elite in imperial times. Yu, however, refused to comply with the demand to reinterpret, instead submitting his original thesis to the deputy director of the propaganda department and editor of the People's Daily, Hu Qiaomu. Hu told Yu to rewrite the piece so that it could be submitted to the magazine People's China, but Yu basically ignored that and instead had his original manuscript published in a completely different magazine, sparking anger not only for his wrong think, but also because he disobeyed a direct command from the party's authority on literature and propaganda. Yu was the epitome of the individualist, Western-educated elite writer who felt that his freedom of thought and expression was more important than the party's goals and vision. Criticism of the article began just a couple of weeks after it was published, starting with a relatively obscure article published by two students in the Journal of Shandong University. A torrent of articles followed, mainly published in the People's Daily, directly criticising Yu's desire to perform research in order to satisfy his own curiosity, as opposed to satisfying the needs of the country and its people. The campaign spiralled to include general critique of Western scholarship in the humanities and social sciences, their bourgeois methodology, and the use of empirical data to the detriment of preconceptions which were so important to Marx's theory. But actual critiques of Yu himself were relatively few, with the party determined to show that they criticised only his ideas and were not necessarily questioning his loyalty to the party. Such restraint was not shown for other intellectuals. In the case of Feng Shui Feng, for example, the attacks were a little bit more direct, but in fairness, so were his criticisms of the CCP and their control over the literary world. Far from being politically neutral, Feng was actually a member of the party and editor of the Literary Gazette, which we mentioned in the last episode was one of the CCP's most important organs of literary dissemination. He was close friends with Ding Ling and had known Lu Xun well, which had initially put him in the party's good books as he was made chief interpreter of the hero of modern Chinese literature. But while Feng was faithful to the party's views on, say, Western imperialism, he was still more of an individualist at heart, and openly critiqued the need to portray society in a realist fashion in literature, as well as what he considered the lowering of standards and lack of professionalism in the literary world in general. He was still on that art-for-art's sake train, a heavy dissenter of socialist realism, and the amount of pressure the party exerted on intellectuals to say and write the correct things as opposed to what they truly thought. In 1954, just after the whole Yu Ping Bo affair was over, the party switched targets and started attacking Feng for his ideas and his editorship of the journal Literary Gazette. Articles in Literary Gazette had originally praised Yu Ping Bo's article on Dream of the Red Chamber and had rejected articles criticising the paper, only to later publish one with a note saying that the thoughts of the authors were, quote, not thorough or complete enough in certain areas. These two incidents, no matter how small, were enough for the party to launch an all-out attack on Feng, accusing him of using the journal as his own private property. Feng, like Yu, was accused of holding Western-style scholarship in higher esteem than Marxist interpretations, and he was charged with stifling free debate and exchange of ideas, which in reality just meant he didn't prioritise the party-sanctioned view in his journal. Open debate was essentially a euphemism for the processes of ideological remoulding, criticism and self-criticism, periodically carried out by the party on intellectuals. Feng was forced to issue an apology, and he was demoted within the journal to a position on the editorial board with no real power. He was replaced by loyal followers of Zhou Yang, who was determined to have complete control over the literary publication world, which, by the beginning of 1955, he had basically achieved. With the attacks on Yu Ping Bo and Feng Shui Feng, the party had successfully launched two campaigns that aimed to convert the thinking of both non-party and party-affiliated intellectuals, but these campaigns were really just the beginning. Neither the Yu Ping Bo nor the Feng Shui Feng campaign were nearly as serious, organised or vitriolic as the Hu Feng campaign. If anything, the preceding two were just warm-ups to get the crowd excited for what would become a nationwide ideological rectification movement. The genesis of the Hu Feng campaign actually began way before it took place, or before the CCP even came into power, back in the 1930s, when Hu Feng was already butting heads with those who would become senior leaders within the CCP, including and especially Zhou Yang. <laughs> 
Hu Feng had been a close associate of Lu Xun, and along with Feng Shui Feng, they were members of the League of Left-Wing Writers, where Hu made many friends, who later became his close allies under the CCP regime. Hu believed in the primacy of the writer's subjective feeling over the importance of reflecting politics and art. And in fact, even though he called himself a Marxist, he still argued for the complete separation of politics from art. He was a revolutionary and an anti-nationalist, but he was also called pugnacious, argumentative, and was prone to criticise Marxists and non-Marxists alike, which is probably how he got on Zhou Yang's bad side. In 1935, when CCP leaders were calling for writers in Shanghai to form a united front, Zhou Yang disbanded the League and formed a new organisation called the United Association of Chinese Writers, which allowed in all members who opposed the Japanese and who adopted their slogan, Literature for National Defence. In response to this move, Lu Xun and his followers, including Hu Feng, formed their own organisation called the Chinese Literary Workers, and adopted the slogan, People's Literature of the National Revolutionary Struggle, emphasising the revolutionary left-wing aspects of their own beliefs, as opposed to just encompassing all writers, regardless of their political affiliation. When Zhou Yang wrote to Lu Xun, incensed, claiming that Hu Feng was being a stubborn opportunist, Lu Xun defended him, arguing that it was Lu Xun himself who had ordered Hu to act in the way that he had, and that the party was wrong for trying to control the actions of independent writers. This clash between those who believed in the primacy of the party line and those who wanted writers to maintain their independence in their work was a foreshadowing of later clashes and a final showdown between the hardliner Zhou and the more free-spirited but stubborn Hu Feng. The battle started up again in 1951, while the Yu Pingbo and Feng Shui Feng affairs were going on, and the three incidents can all be seen as interrelated as they were all part of a larger scheme by the top party officials in the propaganda and cultural fields to remould intellectuals along Marxist ideological lines. From 1949 onwards, Hu Feng was still going on about how writers should be subjective and use the themes they wanted in their works, as opposed to just writing about the masses and relying on Mao's talks at the Forum in Yan'an for guidance. He called out the party's top cultural officials, Zhou Yang and his clique, for promoting a formalistic and mechanical approach to literature, claiming that the way they operated was suffocating the lives of intellectuals in the same vein as Hitler's regime. Apart from just complaining about the system, Hu Feng actually had a plan to change it from within. His mastermind plan was to get himself and his close allies promoted to positions in senior leadership within cultural and propaganda departments, and then slowly influence the political leaders like Mao until they came round to his way of thinking. His own followers even encouraged him to become a party member in order to help speed up the process. Apparently he wasn't actually a member at this time. He even tried to pander to Mao by writing a short and not very good poem about his ascension to power, but this was criticised for its lack of orthodoxy, so it didn't really help the plan at all. His followers failed to get promoted, and members of what would later be known as the Hu Feng clique were attacked and singled out for ideological remoulding efforts. Eventually, in 1952, the critics turned to focus on Hu himself. His critics claimed that his writing was devoid of class consciousness or political ideology, and that Hu refused to recognise that a writer should engage in ideological studies and practical activities as well as creative pursuits. Hu Feng erroneously promoted the bourgeois Western idea that literature was about the writer's subjective point of view, and therefore was above class, outright rejecting Mao's notions that literature and art should be solely for the masses reflecting the experiences of workers, peasants and soldiers, and that expressions, styles and themes used in literary works should reflect those used by the masses in their own folk arts. Despite all this criticism, however, Hu Feng refused to let go of his beliefs, refusing to publish any self-criticisms that were up to standard. Despite his stubbornness, however, his persistence in trying to get himself and his colleagues into positions of power actually started to pay off in the more relaxed years of 1953 to 1954. Several of them took up important positions in publishing houses, regional propaganda departments, and writers' unions, and their works were finally being accepted for publications in journals such as People's Literature, which had previously refused to publish anything to do with the group unless it was a criticism of them. Hu Feng himself was even made a member of the National People's Congress, an editor of People's Literature, and also became a member of the executive board of the Chinese Writers' Union, 
Having finally found his stride, who felt that this was the perfect time to start beating people over the head with his ideas for literary reform, starting with the Central Committee of the CCP? In a report to the committee, he made about five different arguments. One, his purpose was to correct the leadership of the cultural and intellectual world, not to disrupt the political system, nor to criticise the leaders of the CCP. Two, he did not believe in the imposition of Marxist communist worldview on writers, and argued that communism was a flexible ideology that changed with the demands of the masses, and that it could not be a substitute for realism. Three, socialist realism was actually more similar to 19th century Western humanism, and literary work should not be directed by politics, but rather an understanding of humanity. Four, writers should not only have to immerse themselves in the lives of peasants, workers and soldiers, otherwise they risk overlooking the world around them, which is already full of enough subjects and themes to fuel their work. And five, he rejected the idea that writers should only write about bright things, as this would prevent people from struggling for a better future. More emphasis was needed on darkness and backwardness, as it was these themes that brought writers in line with the struggles and suffering of the people. As solutions to these problems, Hall suggested that seven or eight writers' organisations be created with their own publications to replace official ones, the editorial boards of which could include Communist Party members, but the party would have no power of oversight or inspection. Basically, he was demanding a separation of cultural production and the state freedom of creativity for intellectuals, and a literature that would allow the masses to see something other than the view of the party. These were some very bold statements to be making and some huge things to be asking for, especially when the party hadn't actually reached out to him for his opinion. However, the nature of the proposal, which was addressed to the Central Committee and not, as I understand it, publicly published, probably didn't really warrant the harsh action taken against Hu Feng and all of his associates. For context, it should be remembered that as Hu wrote this letter, the party was in the middle of pushing through the first five-year plan, which was also cast as a more political ideological exercise than a purely economic plan due to the lack of resources and the need for large-scale mobilisation of labour. So in effect, Hu Feng's image was raised as the target of class struggle an example to the people that contrary forces still existed among society and that all thoughts of individualism had to be purged and that one's first duty was to the state. In other words, the campaign against Hu Feng went from being an ideological struggle amongst high-level cultural workers to a nationwide political struggle in aid of the first five-year plan. So things started to go down when Hu was invited to speak at a meeting at the Central Committee in October of 1954, an opportunity he used to actively reiterate the arguments that he had laid out in his letter, but this time directly to the faces of those he had accused of abusing their power. Unfortunately, Hu Feng had walked into a trap. Those he had accused had got hold of his letter before the meeting, and had clearly been given permission by the central party leaders to take it in turns to attack Hu in their speeches. They even got a letter from one of his former allies completely denouncing him and kind of shaking the foundations of his whole support system. Following the meeting, Hu's letter was published publicly, along with a criticism by Zhou Yang, and from January 1955, letters of criticism appeared in the People's Daily from some of China's most famous writers, including Guo Moro, Ai Qing, Lao Xie, and Mao Dun. Hu tried to publish an apologetic self-criticism, more to divert the attacks away from his followers, but the publication was delayed, and instead it was printed along with a volume of Hu's letters to his followers, which had been confiscated by the government, and had been published with an explanatory note apparently written by Mao Zedong himself. This was a huge turning point. Hu became a counter-revolutionary, and then an anti-communist leader of the Nationalist Imperialist Secret Service, until he was finally arrested in July. His close followers fared little better. One was sent to a mental institution, while the others were sent down to the countryside for labour reform. As for the symbol of Hu Feng, it was used to attack anyone who showed counter-revolutionary tendencies, and led to purges in the education and cultural institutions, as well as in the military, mass organisations and labour unions. The propaganda was so strong that it even went beyond the central party's control, 
Even the humblest peasant had, apparently, by the end of 1955, heard of Hu Feng and knew what Hu Fengism was, that is, independent thoughts and activities. More importantly, they knew that these were all punishable offences. The campaign served to strain the relationship between intellectuals and the party even further, even extending to those who worked in the scientific community, who were usually exempt from these sorts of activities. There were also a number of suicides from those in the cultural sphere, and innovative production all but dried up in the aftermath, just as the first five-year plan was drawing to a close. The Hufeng incident is not only significant as a demonstration of the lengths that the party went to to gain control, and how often they themselves lost control of events, but also because it affected what came immediately after. So around the same time that the Hu Feng campaign was concluding at the end of 1955, this is when the party realised that there were also some inefficiencies in the five-year plan campaign, and that bureaucratism and undereducated cadres in official positions were causing delays and problems with production. It was at this point that the party also noticed that apparently many intellectuals had basically stopped working in every field from literature to science to engineering, and they were basically refusing to get involved in any party work for fear of being criticised for happening to be middle class and ending up being purged and arrested for being a counter-revolutionary. It seems the party realised that they may have gone a little bit too far with the whole Hu Fungism campaign, and so they started to work on a way to reverse this trend. So this is when they decided to launch the 100 Flowers campaign at the beginning of 1956, which can be broken down into two parts, the first part starting in January 1956 and running all the way to the end of the year in December 1956. In January 1956, Zhou Enlai gave a speech to the Central Committee in which he implored cadres to hire intellectuals in more senior positions in order so that their talents could be used more effectively, and he also encouraged intellectuals to speak more freely and contribute their ideas to the socialist building project. When nothing happened in response, Mao gave a speech himself in May 1956, during which he made his famous call, Let the Hundred Flowers Bloom, Let the Hundred Schools of Thought Contend. This was a call to essentially encourage the opening up of intellectual and academic discourse, which was then throughout the year interpreted into actual policy by the cultural and propaganda departments. Reading some of these policies and decisions made by the party during this period is honestly a little bit triggering because of what had just happened in the Hu Feng campaign. So basically in this first phase, the literary elite admitted that literary creativity had been stifled by overly dogmatic enforcement of certain principles such as socialist realism, and perhaps writers should also be allowed to use other styles, though still interpreting historical events along party lines. They also announced that writers would be allowed to think independently and debate their ideas and compete with one another to see which ideas were most valued in society. They also said that private social groups that discuss literary ideas that were a bit non-conformist would be allowed to continue in private and would not be labelled subversive movements. Basically, they not only took back everything that they had said to Hu Feng, barring a few exceptions, but they also agreed with many of his ideas and put them forward as official policy. Like I said, very triggering. So, how did intellectuals respond to this call? Well, after Mao's speech, in certain fields, debates raged and arguments were put forth that would have been unfathomable just a year ago. Historians debated the accuracy of Marxist periodization, philosophers questioned the role of Marxism-Leninism, geneticists rejected Lysenko's claims about new agricultural techniques to increase crop yields, social scientists called for birth control, and economists pointed out that Marxist economic theories were outdated and were not applicable to China. Writers, by comparison, were a bit more timid, especially the older writers who had been active during the May 4th movement. But gradually, they began to speak out more, particularly younger writers or those who had been at Yan'an and so who had been educated or trained in literature by the CCP. Most of the attacks by writers were levelled at party policies, such as ideological thought reform campaigns and the imposition of socialist realism. Several writers wrote openly, or through short stories, about how socialist realism was a method of distorting reality, so the party could overlook the present hardships by comparing them to past hardships and future glory, 
which some defined as cheap optimism. Some of the ideas in many of the works appear to have been directly lifted from Hu Feng's letter to the Central Committee, published just a year earlier, despite the fact that many writers had vocally criticised Hu at the time. It seems that some writers actually felt quite guilty about what they had done, and perhaps secretly supported Hu Feng even back then. Intellectuals who we discussed before, such as Ai Qing and Xiao Ye Mu, also took this opportunity to blame the relentless control and criticism of their work on their lack of creative production over the past few years. How could they have been creative if the party was stifling their every move? Lots of different types of works were written during this time, essays, poems, short stories, and longer form novels. To give an example of the type of work that was produced during this period, one that had a particular impact, let's discuss Wang Meng's story, A Newcomer to the Organisation Department. The story focuses on Lin Chen, a young idealistic former teacher who joins the party and is ordered to investigate a factory. At the factory, he encounters manager Wang, who cares only for his own prestige and does nothing to correct the problems and inefficiencies that are his responsibility, to the great frustration of his workers, who just want to improve production and efficiency. Outraged, Lin Chen goes to report the manager to the head of the factory, Han, who ignores Lin Chen and then claims that everything is fine. Lin then goes to the cynical department head, Liu, who again brushes off Lin's complaints, as manager Wang's position in the party is too high for him to be brought down. Eventually, Lin bypasses both of these bureaucrats, bringing the problems in the party to light by writing a public letter, criticising manager Wang, and publishing his letter in the People's Daily. Manager Wang is dismissed from the party, but Lin points out that the real problem is actually the department heads, who turned a blind eye to all the problems and continue to support manager Wang in his position. But his arguments are ignored, and eventually he gives up, realising that officials in the party are too senior for him to fight against alone. This story was meant to reflect the disillusionment of younger party members, who strove for real change and criticised the party directly as opposed to just the party's literary policies. Shockingly, many cadres were not happy with the amount of criticism that they had received as part of this campaign, and Wang Meng's story proved to be a focal point for the expression of their grievances. After an article was released in the People's Daily, pointing out that too many satirical pieces about dogmatism were being released, the tide of criticism turned against dogmatism to instead focus on excessive liberalism. Essentially, the cadres who were offended by Wang Men's pointing out their flaws turned the tide of criticism against the author himself. Several critiques of Wang Men's story were published in journals such as Literary Studies for its attack on leadership structures, but many were also published in defence of Wang's work, pointing out that people didn't criticise cadres for fun, but because serious changes were needed if the revolution was going to succeed. But because of this sudden shift at the beginning of 1957, many writers became silent once again, and the second phase of the Hundred Flowers movement wasn't launched until April, and ran on until June 1957. In April, Mao Zedong made a speech on the correct handling of contradictions among the people, which we've discussed briefly in a previous episode and we'll probably also discuss again, when we talk about the end of the five-year plan. In this speech, Mao encouraged open discussion, believing that indoctrination in party ideology had made the CCP's position secure enough to withstand the good-natured criticisms of the intellectuals. He even went as far as to encourage discussion of political issues, something which had never really occurred before. However, a torrent of criticism was launched from even the party's top most loyal officials from all different sectors of the economy, many of which was aimed at the party itself, not just the cadres who implemented their policies. It went so far that people started to point out that the state party alliance was just plain wrong and infringed on the rights of the people, and that the CCP's so-called alliance with other democratic parties was nothing but a sham. Even Mao Zedong thought, once so revered, was questioned by academics who felt it irrelevant to their teachings and felt that Mao had no place telling them how to think or what to teach. Students began criticising official political involvement in their studies and the politicisation of academia, and began calling on the party to restore those intellectuals who had been wrongly convicted under the regime, including, and especially, Hu Feng. <laughs> 
Instead of revealing perhaps what Mao Zedong had hoped, that there really was a unity of thought and feeling between the party and the people based on patriotism, the campaign revealed that despite years of thought reform, repression and purges, the individualist spirit was alive and well amongst Chinese intellectuals. This problem, once revealed, had to be dealt with immediately, and so the party launched the anti-rightist campaign, which lasted for two years, and which will be the topic of the next episode. In many ways, the Hundred Flowers movement seemed much like the May 4th movement revisited. Like I said in the previous episode, the CCP and official literary organisations of the state and party would constantly invoke the spirit of the May the 4th movement, as well as the ideals of Lu Xun in creating a new Chinese society. The bipolar nature of their policies and the instigation of large-scale campaigns, followed by the retraction of state intervention in early years, left many writers with a glimmer of hope that their May 4th ideals may, after all, be realised. Even when they weren't invoking it, many writers of the May 4th era were those who were writing in the 1950s, and they carried with them the dream of a new revolution in Chinese literature, one that would finally realise their long-held dream of an independent literary sphere that could freely explore society and politics and express their ideals as intellectuals. Sadly, this dream was not to be recognised. The CCP deliberately never created a formalised, consistent cultural policy, opting instead to keep a flexible attitude towards culture and intellectuals so that they could turn the tide at any moment and keep the situation to their advantage, i.e. making sure that cultural production at all times affirmed the overall goals of the CCP and confirmed their legitimacy as the primary and only real stakeholders of literature and art. Something that I read that I didn't know about before starting this episode was that after Zhou Yang was denounced and arrested during the Cultural Revolution, spoiler alert for the 1960s, Hu Feng felt that he would finally be released from prison. After all, his ideological opponent had been purged, and so he was vindicated, right? Well, in actual fact, the party instead opted to assert that Hu Feng had been part of Zhou Yang's clique all along, citing some minor points on which they had agreed when it came to literature, such as the fact that writers should be able to choose their own subjects or that the highest principle of art is truth. Zhou and Hu had been enemies since the 1930s, and Zhou had been instrumental in Hu's downfall. But this didn't stop the party from rewriting history entirely to suit their own narrative. There was no reality in which one of these men could be right and the other wrong. And this narrative shows how the party's discourse on culture remained, throughout the Maoist era, entirely focused on the preservation of central control at the expense of even those who were most loyal to the regime. Okay. So that's it for this episode, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to sign up for the Sinobabble newsletter if you want. And I hope you tune into the next episode. 